the year is 430 AD. The Huns have built an empire on the Hungarian plain, dominating the local tribes and asserting control over parts of Germania. In the south and the west, the Roman Empire was fractured between east and west, with Valentinian III on the western throne and Theodosius II on the throne of the Eastern Empire. In 434, Ruga, the longtime ruler of the Huns, died and was succeeded by his two nephews, Attila and Bleda. The Eastern Empire under Theodosius II struggled to defend their Balkan lands from the Huns, forcing them to pay a large tribute every year. In 440, the Romans failed to make this payment as they had diverted funds and troops to help the West hold off the Vandal invasion, which had taken hold in Africa and was attempting an invasion of Sicily. This left much of the Balkans void of troops, allowing the Huns to move unopposed through much of Mosia and Illyricum. The Hunnish army sacked Margus and Viminacium, and then took Sigidunum and Sirmium. The Sassanid Shah Yazdegerd II Realizing Roman weakness launched his own invasion of Armenia in 441, forcing Theodosius to recall his troops from Sicily in 442, ordering a large issue of new coins to finance operations against the Huns, which he believed that he could defeat as he refused the Hunnish king's demands. Attila and Bleda regrouped and responded with a campaign in 443. For the first time, the Hunnic forces were equipped with battering rams and rolling siege towers, with which they successfully assaulted the military centers of Ratiara and Nisus. Advancing along the Nishov River, the Huns next took Serdica, Philippopolis, and Arcardiopolis. The Huns encountered a Roman army outside of Constantinople, which would result in a decisive Hunnic victory but they were stopped by the double walls of the eastern capital. Marching south, they would defeat a second army near Caropolis. Theodosius, unable to make effective resistance, admitted defeat and accepted the Hunnic demands. The terms were harsher than the previous treaty, as the tribute was nearly tripled. Their demands being met allowed the Hunnic kings to withdraw into the interior of their empire. Bleda would die shortly after the Huns' withdrawal in 445. Attila would take the throne for himself, becoming the sole ruler of the Huns. In 447, Attila again rode south into the Eastern Roman Empire through Mosia. The Roman army under the Gothic general Arnagescus met him in the Battle of Udus and was defeated, the Huns having a decisive victory, though not without heavy losses. They would march south unopposed, reaching as far as Thermopylae, before being forced to withdraw back to their heartland. In 450, Attila proclaimed his intent to attack the Visigothic Kingdom of Toulouse by making an alliance with Emperor Valentinian III. Attila had previously been on good terms with the Western Roman Empire and its influential general Flavius Aetius. Aetius had used Hunnic mercenaries that Attila provided to uphold Gaul against numerous invasions from the barbarians, which Attila's conquests had driven from their homes into Rome. However, Valentinian's sister, Honora, had sent the Hunnish king a plea for help and her engagement ring in order to escape her forced betrothal to a Roman senator in the spring of 450. Honora may not have intended a proposal of marriage, but Attila chose to interpret her message that way. He accepted, asking for half of the Western Empire as dowry. When Valentinian discovered the plan, he was furious. He also wrote to Attila strenuously denying the legitimacy of the supposed marriage proposal. Despite this, Attila sent an emissary to Ravenna to proclaim Honora was innocent and that the proposal had been legitimate and that he would come to claim what was rightfully his. Attila would soon come to gather his vassals and begin his march west. In 451, he crossed the Rhine. Upon entering hostile territory, 
he spread his troops out, allowing them to raid and forage across northern Gaul, sacking cities on the way. Aetius moved to oppose Attila, gathering troops from among the Franks, the Burgundians, and the Celts. A mission by Avidus, one of Theodoric's former advisors, convinced the Visigothic king Theodoric I to ally with the Romans. The combined armies of Aetius and Theodoric marched north. Attila was now converging his army near Arleanum, attempting to cut Gaul in half by seizing a strong point on the river. Though the Roman allied army arrived first on June 14th, this ruined Attila's plan who had hoped to take the city uncontested. Being in a disadvantageous position where his fast and highly skilled cavalry was less effective, opted to move back to the Catalonian plains to his rear. This allowed Aetius to gather even more troops from the various tribes along the coast, bolstering his numbers. From Aurelianum, Aetius and his coalition pursued Attila. Attila would be forced to set up a tactical delay along his route of retreat in order to keep Aetius from catching him before he arrived at the Catalonian plain. The two forces at last met on June 20th. The night before, Attila had sent a cavalry detachment to occupy a ridge overlooking the valley. He then encamped his main army on the banks of the scene. Early on June 20th, Aetius appeared. Aetius needed a quick and decisive victory, fearing his coalition of men would split off in a prolonged conflict. As the armies were deploying, the Visigothic cavalry under King Theodoric's son, Thorismund, engaged the Hunnic cavalry which had been placed there to attempt to slow the Romans down. They withdrew slowly, showering the enemy with arrows. The harassment slowed down Thorismund's advance. It wasn't until four hours later that the Visigoths finally gained control of the heights. Instead of advancing towards the middle of the field, where he would be vulnerable to encirclement by the fast-moving Huns, Aetius anchored his right flank on the rising slope to the south, and his left wing on the thick forest to the north. Theodoric and the Visigoths held the right wing, most of them dismounted to protect themselves from the Hunnic archers. A small cavalry contingent remained in reserve, commanded by the king himself. The mounted Alans were placed in the center right. Perhaps doubtful of their dedication to the cause, Aetius wanted to surround the Alans with trustworthy troops. Rather than dismounting like the rest of the battle array, the Alans fought on horseback, similarly to the Huns. Aetius was in command of the center left. From there to the left wing extended the Roman infantry, including the Franks, Burgundians, Saxons, and other allied tribes. Like the Visigoths, the majority dismounted. Two cavalry contingents were placed in rear to plug any holes in the line. Aetius's defensive deployment left Attila with no option except a frontal assault. He took up position in the center with his Huns, the core of his army. On the left wing, Ostrogothic cavalry formed in the front. Arrayed in the second line were Germanic footmen. On the right wing, Frankish infantry and Gepid cavalry were placed in front, with another contingent of Germanic infantry in the back. With only five to six hours remaining until sunset, Attila planned to focus his attack on the weaker Roman center right. Placement of mounted Alans was the most vulnerable point in Aetius's line, and he wanted to take advantage of that. He tasked the Franks and Gepids on the right and the Ostrogoths on the left with pinning down the Romans and Visigoths to allow him time to break the Alans. The Huns attacked in successive waves, maximizing the effect of their archery. The Alan contingent bore the brunt of the storm of the arrows as the Hunnic barrage continued for hours, giving Aetius' men no breaks. After weakening the Roman line, Attila ordered a general charge, 
on a very narrow front, the Hunnic wedged formation smashed into the Alans, cutting straight through their formation. Overwhelmed, some of the Alans held on, while others fled, opening gaps that split the Roman army in two. Theodoric and Aetius turned their cavalry contingents in an attempt to plug the hole in the center and stop the breakthrough. Then came Attila's Germanic infantry. The men in the front clashed with their shields in close combat. The Roman left was able to hold off the assault, however on the right the Visigoths were pressed hard by the combined charge of the Huns, Ostrogoths, and the mixed Germanic infantry. When word reached Aetius that King Theodoric was killed in the fighting while rallying his men, he realized that this was a crucial moment in the battle. Roman general gave the signal to Thorisman, who had remained hidden from view behind the crest of the hill. The Visigothic cavalry charged down the slope. Caught by surprise, Attila's Germanic infantry attempted to form a line against the cavalry, but they were quickly overrun. In the center, Aetius managed to stabilize the line. Attila's attempt to break the Roman army in half had failed and with his left faltering, he was now at risk of encirclement. Attila was forced to disengage and flee to the camp, with his troops following close behind as night fell. It remains unclear why Aetius didn't press the advantage when he had Attila at his mercy. Whatever the case, Attila was able to withdraw from the field in good order and head back across the Rhine, ending his campaign in Gaul.